I'd like to ask everyone to please either turn off or silence your cell phones. Before we get started with the matters that are in public hearing today, I'd like to make a couple of announcements. The Metropolitan Code requires four votes for the board to grant an application. Once a vote is taken on your application, a party who disagrees with the outcome may request a rehearing within 60 days. Parties may also appeal the decision to the Davidson County Chancery Court by filing a writ of certiorari within 60 days. All parties are encouraged to seek independent legal counsel before filing an appeal to ensure that all deadlines and procedures are followed. Just a brief announcement about the microphones for parties who are gonna come up and speak to the board. There's a little button on the table beneath the base of the microphone that looks like a little person when you touch that button. The red light will come on at the end of the microphone. That's how you'll know it's on. And before you start speaking, if you'd please provide your name and address for the board, and then you can make your presentation. For any cases that are not contested today, the applicant will have five minutes to make a presentation. If there are any contested matters before the board today, then both the proponents and opponents will have 10 minutes on each side. So the 10 minutes is gonna be aggregated. Therefore, anybody who might wish to um, speak either in favor or against one of the applications, you might wanna consult with all of your peers who are also gonna be speaking to try to organize who's going to go in order and spend the 10 minutes that you have allotted to you. Without objection, we're going to go ahead and call up the second case on our docket today. So the first case that we're going to be hearing is case 2022-164. I'm just gonna quickly sort through my slides and pull it up. Case 2022-164 is a request for a variance from the street setback and maximum building coverage requirements to construct a duplex at 3205 Granny White Pike, zoned R8. Granny White Pike is an arterial street, therefore it requires a 40 foot street setback. The applicant is seeking to retain the contextual setback of the existing structure and is also requesting to exceed the permissible lot coverage by 6%, therefore requesting a 51% lot coverage in a zoning district that otherwise permits 45% of building lot coverage. In our slides here is a map of the zoning district in this area. The aerial view of the neighborhood. So um, to the right side of your screen, you're gonna see Severe Park and then Granny White. This is, even though it's got a Granny White address, it's uh, kind of like just immediately south of the 12 South area. This is the existing structure that's there on the property now. And then these are street views to show the contextual setback to the north and south. This is the rear of the lot as it looks today. The contextual setback that was submitted, uh, the contextual setback survey submitted by the applicant. This was the site plan submitted by the applicant. Infill development plan provided by the applicant and a slide with the conditions of approval that have been proposed by the applicant and which were forwarded to you upon receipt. Is there anyone here wishing to speak in opposition to the request today? And we also have a councilman cash here. Councilman, would you prefer to go before the applicant or would you wish to speak after the applicant presents? Okay, thank you. I believe I did not see anyone in opposition. Is that correct, Mr. Chairman? I did not see anyone in opposition either, so. Okay, thank you. Well then, um, you may come forward and make your presentation at this time, thanks. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dwayne Cuthbertson, 409 Merritt Avenue. Um, 
representing Richland Building Partners, the owners and developers of this property. Um, as Ms. Waits um, announced, we are requesting two variances of the zoning code to allow a two-family redevelopment of this site, um, a variance of the setback and a variance of the building coverage. Um, you'll notice if Ms. Waits will go back to the um, parcels map. Uh, this lot has a fairly unique shape um, as it is configured along the frontage. Um, this lot, along with the two to the south of us and the one to the north of us, or the two to the north of us, were modified as a result of TDOT taking some decades ago. Uh, there was a planned interchange at 440 and TDOT came in and purchase took uh, the right of way in front of these lots and reduced it from uh, the dimensions that it was originally platted with. These were originally platted at 60 by 150 or 9,000 square feet. Um, if this lot were in its original shape, if, uh, 60 by 150, we probably wouldn't be before this board, certainly wouldn't be asking for a variance of the lot coverage, um, but likely not requesting a variance of the setback either. Um, the zoning code requires a 40-foot setback. If we were uh, required to follow the literal interpretation of the code, set back 40 feet, reduce our building footprint, I think it would result in an outcome that um, would be grossly out of character with a neighborhood. We'd have to go up three stories um, and push back from that contextual setback. So it would, it would really stick out. What we're proposing is something we feel like is moderated, uh, fits within the context, um, we've presented an elevation that we think uh, matches the, 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 the scale, at least, uh, of the neighborhood. Uh, and we're willing to make that elevation a uh, condition of approval. Um, it's one of the conditions listed uh, that we've submitted to you all for consideration that we would um, restrict the height of this building to two stories. Um, over a basement and that second level would also be pushed back so that it's got a little bit of a moderated um, presentation to the streetscape. So um, this, we made this application a few months ago and started working with the council member and the community. Um, the first time we came to this hearing, a number of folks from the community showed up. We stepped outside. I was able, I think, to, to provide answers to a lot of their concerns and questions, and then we work particularly with the neighbor to the north um, to, to uh, hash through a number of issues. Um, the most important one, or one of the more important ones, was related to stormwater. And so um, at her request, and we went above and beyond and hired an engineer to come out and design a stormwater plan that would um, really take most, if not all, of the stormwater coming toward these sites. And that stormwater does, it rushes straight to her property uh, from the neighborhood to the south and, and, and west. And our plan uh, hopes to divert that. So that it's an engineered stamp plan, and we've submitted it to this board as a an exhibit, and we're willing to um, accept that plan as a condition of approval if this board is uh, willing to grant that approval. So um, I feel like we've done a lot of work. We've got a lot of conditions that we're, we've submitted to this board for consideration uh, of approval. They do include planting trees. Um, this would allow us to take out the driveway along the front and kind of restore that, that neighborhood character. Um, and so, so we feel like those conditions, along with our exhibits, result in something that's a lot more contextual um, in keeping uh, with the character of the neighborhood. And so uh, with that, I'll, probably just uh, stop and, and answer any questions that you all might have, allow folks from the neighborhood and the council member to speak and maybe address any comments, concerns, questions that we hear. So you're willing, I, I think this is clear, but I just want to be 100% clear, you're willing to agree to all 10 of these conditions that have been submitted in this? Yes, right. yes, sir. Right. Yes. So uh, the condition about the trees, and I think the trees are, are great, I, what, is that going to be planted on the property or on the TDOT right-of-way? Um, I, so <laughs> ideally, yeah. the tree that's there is planted in the TDOT right of way. Right. So yeah. ideally we'd put it clo as close to the sidewalk as we can. Sure. It's just like within any infill, you, you can plant trees in that planting strip between the sidewalk and the street. Okay. Yeah. And so I think we'd prefer to yeah. get it a little closer to the right. street to sure. provide shade. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I just didn't know it and just maybe seven more Code staff could help with it if that's if that's legal to allow allow that as a condition if it's not part of the property 
but um, okay, okay. <laughs> well, Keep that you, in the back of your mind. Ed. You know, the condition states that it, there would be two along Granny White in the front of the, of okay. the house. So, I mean, okay. I think as long as they're in the front yard, then. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. That makes sense. Consistent with my tree thing, what type of trees are you planting on? Um, in the front, it, no species has been determined. Um, in my mind, they're two large canopy trees, um, certainly not hackberries. Uh, in fact, we plan to take out the hackberries that are on the site. Um, so if you have two deciduous large canopy tree species that uh, you think fit well <laughs> across from Severe Park, we're certainly open to consideration. Uh, Suggestions. Um, it, I, in terms of the requirement to bury NES private service lines, is that something that we can include as a condition, or is it, has NES represented that, they, that that's acceptable? Uh, with, with all new infill, we don't have a choice. Okay, we have to bury our service okay. lines. That's I, that was my main. Yeah. Any further questions? Okay, we'll close the public hearing, and I think Councilperson Cash wants to speak too. So, okay, go on up, Councilperson Cash. Thanks. I won't take long. Uh, I appreciate. I, I know it was deferred a couple of times, and I appreciate Dwayne and his team taking the time to work with neighbors and neighbors association who did have some concerns. I mean, it, it, as we first looked at it, it seemed like it was a choice between. First, let me say that I don't think there was ever any issue with the the setback variance because of the decades old. Um, um, you know, right of way, T dot right of way issue, and where the houses are situated now. I don't think there was ever any question that that made sense, um, and and was in was in concert with with what was what had been what was existing. Um, but the we did need to spend a lot more time on the um, lot coverage variance because it seemed like it was a choice between do we want something taller than that than what's typical, or do we are we open to you know. Uh, approving or, or, or assenting to a variance that, that did put more on the lot. And there were some concerns with that. I don't want to go down the whole list of 10 things, but, you know, stormwater, especially by the close neighbors, was a, a big concern. Tree, talking about trees. And um, the, the as typically comes up with these kind of things, the agreement that it wasn't, the property wouldn't be used for short-term rentals was was obviously big on a number of neighbors' minds. Uh, so, like I said, I appreciate uh, him working, taking the time to work with neighbors and come to this, come to this uh, something that I think folks can live with. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, we'll close the public hearing and discuss. Thoughts? I suppose I, should, I need to uh, state for the record that this uh, is a property that I've visited because I go on a walk with my son past it just about every day so uh, yeah I, I would I would agree with Councilman Cash that the uh, setback variances there's certainly a hardship there and, and I remember we saw the uh, the house two doors down in my term here um, not long ago so I, I think that that that's kind of a no-brainer and and I appreciate his explanation on the the lot size variance, I think that, you know, with working with the neighbors, I think that makes sense. They might want to make it smaller and wider rather than taller and, and, and smaller. <laughs> so I, I'd be, I, I, I could support the motion. Yeah, it's one of those situations where actually I like, it, especially with the lot coverage, strict adherence to the lot coverage, I almost worry would have the adverse impact um, in terms of forcing Forcing something that's going to be out of character with. with. So I'll make a motion that we that we approve the variance as presented with the, uh, with the conditions that are uh, uh, on the screen that, that the applicant has agreed to, uh, based on the hardship of the unique uh, characteristics of the lot. Okay, motion a second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Unopposed. Okay, that passes.
Thank you. So we will go back to the first case on the docket. Okay. Yep. Okay, at this time we're going to move to case 2022-157. This is a request for a special exception from the height setback and landscaping requirements for a proposed multifamily adaptive residential development at 1302 and 1308 Dickerson Pike, zone CS. The planning department has recommended approval with the following conditions. Compliance with the major and collector street plan, preservation of 20 feet of public right of way for an existing alley to the rear of the property and design approval to be obtained by MDHA prior to permit issuance. In addition, NDOT has also assented uh, with compliance to the major and collector street plan as well as would request approval on the condition that on street parking or loading be prohibited. Before you hear is the zoning map of this area in an aerial view. This is the site. So there is development to the rear of the site, but the, the parking lot area and, and green area that you see is a subject lot. This is a side view of the lot. It's there at the corner, of course, of Dickerson and, and a side street. And a view of the bigger portion of Dickerson sort of down below. This is the site plan that's been submitted by the applicant. The applicant's proposed height specifications, the proposed landscape buffer exception, the proposed setback specifications, a text description of the special exception requests that have been submitted by the applicant, and the planning department and NDOT recommendations, as well as um, a view of the map of the alley to the rear of the property that's referenced in the planning department's recommendation. Is there anyone here wishing to speak against this request today? Um, seeing none, Chairman, then is the applicant here? Okay, great. If you would please come forward, you'll have five minutes to make your presentation. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. My name is Scott Morton, principal at Smith G Studio 602 Taylor Street in Germantown. Um, we've been representing this project with this community over the last two years. Uh, originally, we wanted to work with the owner to develop a by ride scheme under the, the current zoning CS. Um, when we met with the community and Councilman Parker, uh, there was tremendous uh, uh, concern about that the proposed development, if it sought BZA exceptions, uh, there's nothing that would prohibit short-term rentals, which was a, a very big concern for the community. So we went back to look at rezoning the property and we have rezoned or submitted a rezoning request for CSNS, which would apply a, a complete prohibition of the short-term rental uh, component for this property. Um, we met with the, that, I'm sorry, that project uh, application has been approved by the Planning Commission, has been approved by the Metro Council, and is awaiting its third and final reading uh, in two weeks. So that is, that part of it and the commitment to restrict short-term rentals is in its final leg of approval in two weeks time. During this period, we met with the community and presented our plans and our exceptions and discussed how they were consistent with the policy. And we got tremendous support for the requests. Uh, people are excited to have something developed in this lot. It's at a very busy or a mixed use intersection where there's an existing coffee shop across the street and retail center. Uh, and everybody's looking forward to this addition. Um, Councilman Parker could not be here today, uh, but he, you know, provided that the board agrees and that this meets policy, um, 
we we feel comfortable moving forward with these requests uh, for this district because of the policy consistency. So if you don't mind, can you please go back to the height exhibit so I can just walk through briefly our rationale for the three requests. And before you do that, you, you say you have three requests, but looking at planning's report, they say it's really four. It, it, okay, What's, what is there? Theirs is... I don't have a copy of that. Request one, a request to per permit an encroachment in the height control plan. Request two, request to reduce the rear building setback. Request three, the properties are across the alley to the west of the subject site area is and mixed use. Um, it requires a land, that's the landscape buffer. Right. And then number four is to reduce the required 15 foot building set back to zero feet. Uh, so they've got four, you guys have three. The fourth one's the same as the first. Request to reduce the building set back from 20 feet to zero along alley 2013. That's the alley setback. The first one's a height control plane. Second one's the alley setback. Third one is the landscape buffer. And then the fourth one, fourth one is the setback on Dickerson Pike. Okay. So, I mean, they're here. Yeah, no, yeah I, that's I, fine. I was, I was that's right. What, when I read y'all's request, I was trying to figure out why do y'all have three and five. Yeah, it must be four. I apologize for the <laughs> confusion. But, but you are looking for all four of those. Correct, okay. for the development of this. Yeah. So um, starting with the first one was height. Um, so the exhibit before you, with the current CS zoning and the proposed CS NS zoning in either condition, the height uh, requirements are the same. And it would allow for, uh, it's the traditional commercial zoning where when written, there was a, a, a desire to have buildings step back after the first 30 feet and then follow a sky exposure plane. So uh, the more in the middle of the site you were, the, the higher height you could have. Well, over the last few decades, a lot has changed in planning policy. And uh, specifically, this has a special policy for the Dickerson South Corridor study. It recommends pushing buildings closer to the street and helping to frame the street. Um, and the policy also recommends heights of six stories, which is what is presented here today, uh, to be consistent with the policy. So the request we have is to penetrate the sky exposure plane for the small triangle area in yellow uh, to provide for a six story building consistent with policy and um, push the building closer to the street uh, per the policy guidelines. Um, part of the request in addition to this is, and all of the requests to some degree have some uh, importance for the right-of-way dedication component for Dickerson. There's a tremendous amount of right-of-way dedication, 15 feet of right-of-way. So 15 feet of the property is being dedicated um, on uh, Dickerson. And that is to provide for future transit access. And so that reservation is a very substantial um, pushing back of the property line, which also pushes back our sky exposure plane. So, with this request, we are looking for relief in the sky exposure plane for the portion on Dickerson and yellow, and then on the subsequent slide, a smaller portion, which would also be from the side streets. Okay, you have 30 seconds remaining. I'll move to the next slide. Man, that was fast. Um, keep going, please. The landscape buffer, this is a requirement from the fire marshal. We have to provide a fire lane on the rear of a 24 foot alley. Uh, so we're dedicating not only enough property to, for its standard Metro 20 foot alley, but another four feet for the fire code requirement uh, to provide our fire access. Because of utility lines on Dickerson, we have to utilize the alley for fire access. Therefore, we're asking for relief from the landscape buffer requirement. If this property were across the street on Ligon, it would not have this landscape buffer requirement in the UZO. Um, but Unfortunately, this area is right outside the UZO, which is also a consideration for uh, potential relief from that. And then lastly, the, the front setback is just the, consistent with policy, having that street edge. Um, there's also contextual reasons for the front setback as well. Um, and we think that that could be um, a better urban condition and pedestrian realm uh, with the buildings set at the back of the new sidewalk. 
So you, you mentioned the alley in the back. Are you dedicating any right away for the alley itself? Yes, we're dedicating right away on all four sides of okay. the development, every frontage. So the alley has a dedication um, currently of nine feet total okay. um, on the rear to accommodate that fire lane and okay. alley standard. Okay. Can you go back to the slide with the landscape buffer? And I should have mentioned it's only for a portion of the, the frontage, the request, because it's only for um, when properties are zoned residential. And behind us, we have multifamily zoning. Yeah, I'm only, I did notice there's across the alley, it looks like that's residential. And I think that's what the uh, planning department says. So can you educate us about, you would be required to have a landscape buffer within your property line <laughs> along that entire alley is that correct? And are you going to have any buffer there? Or is it you, you, what I hear? You're giving up four feet of your property to get the alley width, which you have to do. Right. So is there going to be any landscape buffer there at all? There will be. I think the slide with the site plan can show some of the green strip. I believe it's five feet in total. Okay. Uh, it also has, we, we've got a, an area that extends further on the corner. Um, I want to say that's 15 feet from the back of the proposed alley. It could be slightly less. I can't recall the, the number. But we are accommodating some green landscape buffer on the rear, and we'll be providing planting between the building and the alley, ed the new alley edge. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will. There is no, as I recall, there is no opposition. Is that right? Okay. So we'll close the public hearing and discuss. <laughs> Well, like I said, my concern was the um, whenever there's residential, I always like to see some kind of landscape buffer there. Um, and I mean, I get the alley. They've got to give that up to get what they need for the fire department, everybody else. So, I, I, you know, seems reasonable to me. Um, yeah, I mean, there. just because there's not a landscape buffer per se, there is landscape back there. So it's not quite as stark i think is you know you might think it, it would be you know so i, I think that seems all, all of the requests seem reasonable and and are tied really to i mean a lot of you know the, the dedications that they're doing i mean um i i think all the requests do seem reasonable but i know miss davis has I'll, always had thoughts on things in this part of town so i'm very curious to hear her thoughts i think that was funny just waiting. Everybody kind of looked at me. Um, I was a part of the Dickerson Road South study. Uh, I was one of the steering committee members, and I am very familiar with this area. I'm probably the only person in this room who for like five years took the Dickerson Road bus home. So um, <laughs> I'm very familiar with this area. I will say for a bit of context, when the city was originally lined out and designed, where Douglas is is where the city stopped. And so if you walk down Dickerson, even though he pointed out the UZO is right there, if you just walk across that intersection, it feels completely different. The sidewalks are super narrow, the road narrows because it wasn't designed to be a part of the original like urban core. So it is very different just based off of, Douglas is kind of the line um, when you cross over that. And so I, I really poured into the packet and I poured into this and I was concerned about the landscape buffer because Fern and Ligon are behind it. And I know there's a lot of development slotted for Ligon. We've heard some cases recently regarding Ligon. Um, but there is still residential homes right behind it. And I always like a little bit. I know there's some landscaping, but I think we have a landscape buffer for a reason. And I do appreciate the alley and the dedication. But some of the reason why they have to dedicate it is because of how the, the design of the building is a six story building. You need fire access like that's. I, I, that argument didn't really move me as much because it's like, well, of course you would do that because you want to, if you have a six story building, you want people to be able to get out in case there's a fire. So I don't know if that was enough for me to move on the landscape buffer, but for everything else, I understood why they made the request that they made. And I think it was reasonable. Well, the apparatus is for the fire trucks, like ladders to go up to be able to the power lines that are on the yeah. Yeah. That's what which is also yeah. weird for it yeah. to be a major corridor with power lines, but <laughs> Uh, <laughs> That's neither here nor there. <laughs> yeah. So do you have do you have, do you have thoughts on what, what, what could be altered with the landscape buffer to 
make it better or can we like is there a compromise i mean like i was going to lean into our architects because they know more than i do and if this is the best that they can do then i'll support it but it just seems sort of aggressive not to have any landscape no like no requirement for any landscape buffer considering there's a residential neighborhood that's right behind it yeah but if this is the best then you know i'll defer to I mean, people that are smarter than well, and I didn't understand that there was going to be no landscape buffer, and I wasn't real clear about. I mean, it looks like for some of it, there's a good good amount. Do you have this one section that does look like it's probably two feet or a row of trees or something? But I didn't understand there was going to be no buffer. Maybe we need to get clarification on that. Well, the request said zero. Yeah. I did see the designs in the picture, so yeah. that's why I was. They're not. They wouldn't be required to. Yeah, and. I mean, the landscape, the landscape buffer is, you know, I, I typically see more of a use for that where you, like, maybe wouldn't have an alley. Like, if, if these were literally going right up to that property line, didn't have that alley separating it. The alley allows for transition. The alley allows for that transition, no scale. Um, you know, I, I. I think I think a landscape buffer would honestly honestly be kind of weird here because you'd have this random you know strip of dense vegetation like kind of like between like the building and the alley, and then you got this alley and then the house. I think that would honestly be a, a you know not as good of a condition you know for the neighborhood really. Um, so I, I I think and especially with it only going halfway across the property because half of the proper a third of the, I don't know forty percent of the property doesn't require one. Um, and so you end up having this weird kind of strip of ditch vegetation or however, or I'm assuming they'd probably go for one of the, if they had to do it, one of the, you know, ones, I, I, I don't know which, which landscape buffers apply. There's some that have, you can put a fence and with some bushes along and that right. counts as your landscape buffer, but that would be kind of weird across, you know, 60% of the property and then just stops. So, um, I just, I, I think it'd be a better environment without the landscape buffer as weird as that sounds <laughs> I, I i think that honestly makes more sense okay okay anybody prepared to make a motion or so made the other motion uh, i'll i'll make a motion that we approve the uh the special exceptions as, as presented with the request noted uh, or, or with the uh, conditions noted by the uh, planning department's recommendations that the major collector street plan uh, requirements be met, that the um, alley should be a minimum 20 feet in, in width, and that uh, it, would, it would be reviewed by the uh, MDHA and, and all the things presented here um, uh, with, with, with the original presentation. May I uh, interrupt just briefly to ask uh, whether you also wanted to include the end dot or whether you did not want to include the end dot? Yes, condition. including the end dot. Uh, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, motion. Is there, there's a second. Okay, motion is second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. aye. Okay. Looks like it passes six, six votes to zero again. Okay, thank you. Next case. So on case uh, 2023-017, is there opposition Anybody here in opposition on this case? This is 017. Okay, no opposition. Right, this is our last case for the afternoon. Case 2023-17 is a request for a variance from the accessory building height controls to permit a 23-foot detached structure at 1713 Warfield Drive in the RS-10 zoning district. The maximum permitted height in the zoning district for a rear structure is 16 feet. So this is the zoning district map, an aerial view of the neighborhood. This is located in Green Hills, not far from Lipscomb University. This is the 
front structure and it's in a single family zone. And this is the rear structure that's the subject to the request. A few photos from different angles. This is a side view to get a sense of the height as compared to the principal structure in front. And finally, the site plan. And um, it, it looks like we've had some letters just, or some information distributed to you all. And then there's also a letter on your desk from a neighbor that we just received today wishing to express opposition. And since there's no one uh, here to speak against the application, then you all will have five minutes to make your presentation. And whoever's speaking, if you would be sure and hit the red button so that your microphone lights up like this one. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, appreciate the time and the opportunity to come here and speak to you. Uh, my name is Will Pendleton and partner with my wife, Lauren Pendleton, we're requesting a height variance, as you heard earlier, for our one and a half story garage at 1713 Warfield Drive. And this is an address we've called home since 2016. Uh, joining us in support is, of this request is our architect, Jeff Steele, and our legal counsel, Sean Henry. Uh, as it stands today, this one and a half story detached garage is sitting on our property, partially constructed and framed up to a total height of 23 feet. Our garage is built according to the plans we submitted and received approval from via codes. However, we proactively put a pause on the construction as soon as we realized that the code specified a 16 foot maximum height for detached building. And so let me just, yes, sir. what happened there? Because whenever it gets built and it's, how did it get approved? And then it went up to 23 feet. It was approved at the height. Oh, it was approved by planning. I mean, by the zone co uh, codes. Yes, Chairman okay. Pepper, I can shed some light on that. The Zang Examiner, the drawings that the applicant submitted did have um, the elevations, what they constructed. The they, examiner, the, yeah, it did. They did uh, have the elevations. Yes, sir. What it did not have, and I've talked to the examiner, it did not show the height of the building on the structure. Um, it showed it showed the elevations um, and the pitch and the, you know, being kind of two stories. Uh, but the examiner just put 16 foot maximum height on it and what should have occurred, the examiner should have rejected the plans and, and asked for a resubmittal uh, rather than just saying, hey, our requirement 16 feet, regardless of what you turned in, it sort of implies to the builder that, oh, they approved our permit, so it's these drawings and that was not the case. So okay. there's, there's a, our, our hands are not fully clean on this one. So. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. No, I, I appreciate the extra color. Thank you very much. Um, and just jumping back in, uh, our home sits at the bottom of a small valley. As such, it is subject to frequent flooding. The, to address this, we employed a civil engineer who recommended we install 84 linear feet of French drains around both the home and the detached garage, aiming to improve both drainage and runoff. Additionally, we made a conscious effort to limit the amount of impervious surface area uh, around our home. Uh, given our home's history of flooding, we determined the best way to do this was in fact to build upwards as opposed to outwards across the span of our backyard. As such, the footprint of our garage totals 880 square feet, which equals approximately 30% of the total foundation for our modeled home, well below the 50% threshold for a detached building. Additionally, we intentionally placed the garage at our property's highest point of elevation, therefore mitigating potential issues with impervious ground coverage. Lastly, the garage, as it is currently designed, will be able to use the attic space for dry storage, avoiding flooding issues associated with storing items in our basement, uh, which we have a long history of. Throughout the process, it has been our goal to keep in line with both the scale and architecture aesthetic of our wonderful neighborhood. We originally purchased the home in 2016 because of its character, both the home itself and the neighborhood as a whole. Uh, candidly, would we have been, uh, would have been less expensive to tear down the home and start anew? Yes. But we made a conscious effort to include and keep as much of the original home as possible during our construction process. Uh, this design focus includes our garage, which blends both uh, blends style with our neighborhood, including both scale and style. With respect to the location of our garage, the structure is placed 26 feet away from our back property line, exceeding the minimum requirements of 20 feet, aiming to minimize the visual impact to our neighbors. Our property actually is not the only home under construction currently in our neighborhood, and that's included in some of the pictures you see. In fact, our neighbors at 1711 Warfield are currently building a home that also includes a detached garage. For comparison, the garage structure at 1711 currently rises 29 feet above the structure's foundation compared to our 23 feet. Taking into consideration the elevated foundation, the height of the structure is estimated to total 32 feet, although that does not include the uh, extended elevation, as you can see in those pictures, as the house is, the property is higher than ours. 
Lastly, we made efforts to proactively communicate with our neighbors throughout this process. We recently invited our immediate neighbors to our home to inspect the structure, structure and address any questions they may have. In addition, we walked up, I myself walked up and down both Warfield and Temple, knocking on doors, attempting to meet with each one of our neighbors. While we were unable to speak with every single neighbor, we then followed up with the entire neighborhood with via email, welcoming thoughts and questions. With that in mind, we've received many letters of support, which are included in your packet that you have for prep materials. We also had a handful of neighbors who were kind enough to show up and provide support in person, and thank you for doing that. In summary, we greatly appreciate the opportunity to come here and provide our support, and we look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you. Any, any questions? Questions? Any, and does anybody else at your table would like to speak? I think there's some time remaining, is there not? Yes, sir. There's a minute and 20 seconds okay. for me. I just, I, Jeff Steele, 42 Wind Oak, uh, the architect of record. I just wanted to add, uh, we mentioned attic space. Uh, the current remodeled house does not have attic space. It's a one and a half story structure. Uh, therefore, the need for this above ground storage was a necessity. Thank you. Thank you. Anything, Mr. Henry? Just, just uh, real, real quick. The uh, the third photograph that was just handed out and should be the third pair, the third photo left to right. This was a photo taken from the property owner directly behind the property, and that's the letter that you now have uh, that was submitted here today. This this photo was circulated on social media, so we thought, well, let's let's use that so we can sort of refer to it during the presentation. You can see the slope of this property by the top of the fence. The wooden fence is the Pendleton's fence. This property slopes from the high ground to the right, slopes down to the left, and the drainage of water comes around the structure, around the house, and goes in between the two houses on the left. Um, you know, we, we would submit that the, the real essence of the hardship here is the physical limitations on the property. You also have drainage plans that are part of this submission that show how the water is going to drain um, uh, across the property around, around the structure. So the point is they could have built a bigger footprint and spread it out across more of the property. They chose to build a smaller footprint and go vertical. And as to the adjacent neighbor, the client's prepared, if, if desired, to plant some evergreen screening along that rear property line. Um, but th that's pretty much our end of my comments. So we happy to answer any questions. Questions, anyone? Questions? Okay, no questions. We'll close the public hearing and discuss. And, there, and again, there is no opposition, correct? Okay, no opposition. Mr. Chairman, this may be our... Um, youngest uh, witness ever at the meeting. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. I, uh, I appreciated Mr. Henry's statement uh, as to the hardship because I was kind of wanting to make sure, you know, some clarification as to what it is. But I think that photograph does show a pretty heavy slope. Um, and, you know, as far as <clears throat> the impact on, on stormwater runoff, I you know, I do think he's demonstrated, the applicant has demonstrated a hardship in that regard. Based upon the circumstances and the, the shape of the lot. Yeah, I agree that, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I agree the shape of the lot could be a hardship also. I mean, I, it's not technically a hardship, but um, it seems like there was a miscommunication here and the, the expense to these folks would be... Uh, I would, I'm not the architect or the builder, but I would imagine it would be very significant. And it, it, this is not a case when we've had a few where somebody built it and hoped to get permission later. And I, I know that always makes a difference to me. And it's clear to me that's not the kind of case we have here. So, yeah, I, I would agree. I, I appreciate Joey's testimony that 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 what's what's built as well was presented to the coats official that are due to I, I, in in. You know, and so I, I think there is some some kind of complicity there. But I, I mean, I'm, honestly, looking at the picture that Mr. Henry referenced, I, it, I, I'm more worried about the garage next door. But I'm assuming, Joey, you, you might be able to help us with this. If, if this garage was a, an attached garage, then we wouldn't be here. Is that right? That's correct. Sir. Okay. Okay. Just, so, yeah. okay. Um, yeah, and I guess just, yeah, to put a fine point on that, I think that that photograph demonstrates that at least as is before us 
I don't perceive harm to the neighboring property owner at 1712 who submitted opposition. So I, I think we satisfy that finding under uh, that, that there's no harm to neighboring properties based upon the evidence in the record. Well, the neighbor, the neighbor's opposition states with respect to uh, the visibility um, based upon the uh, the view from the back of the lot, but at least it appears to me that the view from seven, the back of 1712, that the garage that's attached at 1711 Warfield is permitted and is perhaps more impactful on the view than the garage at 1713. I think with respect to that, I, I think that if the way, at least looking look at the plans, the way if it was built, which is a typical ridge, which it, I mean, it reasonably could be modified to at the at the at the place in construction where it is, which you know, I I, I, I think that it could be modified to to, to make it compliant by its continuing getting that ridge down. They would just lose the space up top, um, but. Also, you know that the, the ridge the ridge doesn't go any lower if you take this this back part off, uh, to Mr. To, to Radford's point. But um, so, I guess I'm I'm having a little bit of a hard time with the hardship myself. I, I, but but I also yeah I mean I I, I also I, I keep getting back to the fact that it was. An approved permit, and and they and, and and that they built what they sent in for the permit, and now they're having to come back later, and I I feel for them there. So, I'm I'm kind of I'm I'm still I'm I'm not sold in either direction right now, um, but I'm I'm still thinking through it. Well, I'd say, you know, the neighbor at 1712, if it, my, my understanding is it's five feet too tall, so I'm just visualizing this. If it comes down five feet. I mean, if you're standing there, it's still going to be a big. It's it's still going to be there. I mean, you're you're going to either see more roof or you're going to see more wall. And right now, it's more wall. I mean, you're going to see it, the, 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 from this view. You'll see the same amount of mass, whether it's just right. you know more of its roof or more of its wall. Um, the 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 the, the, um, the soft bit, the eave would be five feet down. The ridge would be the same. With, with this, so it's only that, you know, you, you again, you just see rather than, you know, if this, this is your house, you know, it's a, they, kind of, they kind of did that, so you just going to be back down to that, but that, you know, that ridge height would still be the same regardless. So if, 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 I, if I'm right here, it only really affect it affects your view more if you're standing back further, way back, then, then you're gonna it would obstruct your view more, but, and the closer you get, it's not gonna matter, I would think. Well, I'd, I'd say it would affect it more the closer you get because then you see the wall in front of you rather than kind of the slope, you know, from from, from this far back, it, it, it would not affect it greatly. Uh, you just be seeing, if, if, if this was modified, you'd see more roof rather than wall. But but up close to it, you'd actually, you know, you, you'd, you'd be sloping down, you know, so you would, you would see, rather than seeing a little bit more wall, you'd see just a slope coming down at you, you know, so you might have. I mean, it's 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 pretty nominal. It's pretty nominal effect. That's why you're right. an architect. You can visualize. Yeah, that. right. So well, I, can't. <laughs> I, I I would say it's a pretty nominal effect either way, as far as the the to to the neighbor um, at, at this seventeen twelve with pictures taken. I don't know. Okay, <laughs> that's fair. I guess yeah. I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm working through it myself. Um, no, I I see your point, but then I see the. 
um, photo of what's going on in the front with the dormers and um, it's a lot more roof, but it's a lot more aesthetically pleasing to look at than a blank wall. Although I'll have to say in the packet, it does look like there are windows on that back wall in the packet. If the elevation is drawn. I don't see them installed um, in the well, we photo can, we, we can have. clarify that if you want to. We can open the public hearing and ask. Um, sure. Does anybody yeah. object to that? So we have a question for the applicant. Are there windows? Will there be windows on the back wall? Yes. Uh, there's three, actually, okay. and if that's a part of the agreement, let's do four. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yeah. All right. I um, have, um, this happened where I live, and um, I was very concerned to see a large structure go up um, near the property line, and it is a blank wall, and it is very tall, and so I think that adjusting the bath to make it look like the front would be just more... Um, less harmful to the neighbor, I would think. It wouldn't be so um, such a large structure and so um, prominent. That, that's my um, thought. Would, would, would this structure, if it were attached to the residence, it, w it wouldn't be an issue, right? True, but it would be a lot further away from the property line. It would be a lot less. Yeah, it would have different setback requirements if it's sure. attached to the residence, yeah. but... But theoretically, it could be taller and closer. And I see your point. I just, I, I frankly just think it's ridiculous that this has been approved and there's a, even a question of this having to come down after there's been a approval by the Coast Department. Um, We've had these in the past. Yeah. Oh, I know. <laughs> but I understand your point. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's it's happened in the past, but you make a great point. Yeah. I mean, I just, I, I, yeah. Ma'am, I'm sorry. We we closed the public hearing, and we well, we 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 reopened it for a very distinct purpose. So. so any other thoughts, Ms. Davis? Okay. Yeah. I can. All right. Yep. Well, any motion? Well, uh, I, I actually, can we reopen the public? I, I, unless maybe I, I missed it, but what, was there a, a statement as to the use of this space up here, whether it be a living space? I mean, is it just attic? I thought I heard attic, but we can open up. Can we, can we, I, I'd yeah. like to clarify uh, that. We're going to open what up the, the public the hearing. The use of this space is. One question, what is the use of the second floor of this structure. May I ask you to, to please come forward? And the reason is because um, the recording won't, won't be able to thank you. Sorry. State your name, please. Uh, Will Pendleton. Okay. Uh, homeowner at 1713. And specific use is attic. Okay. Good There's good no address. plumbing going up there, no... No, the original plans had included potential to have plumbing there for a half bath in case we are working in the garage on the car and the garden or things like that. But there was never any plans for whether it be dishwasher, shower, or anything outside of the standard half bath. But, but would would you would it be like finished living space? I guess is the question, or is it just literally like a unfinished attic space? So to be completely candid, that's we are something completely open to. The key driver on this is having storage space. I mean, to be blunt, yes, it'd be great to have some extra space to kids' playroom or something to, to get around. But if we need to make sure that we're staying, we, our goal is to make sure we're staying within codes, and that's why we proactively stop it with construction before we got a complaint as well, too. So we're, we're happy to abide by what is necessary. Okay. Thanks. So, right. Thank you, sir. I mean, but whether it's whether it's... Attic space or use space, I guess, is not, I mean, the issue is still it's five feet too high. I mean, I, I suppose if it's got windows and people are living back there, then. Yeah, I mean, that, 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 that was more, as far, especially for the neighbor's impact, like if there's people, you know, living, a, you know, if it's a, which I'm not saying this is what it is, but if there was like a garage apartment up above there and the people looking down on, you know, their backyard, then that that's one thing versus, uh, versus a storage space. Uh, may not end up going that otherwise.
Well, we 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 back up to us. Yes. Okay. <laughs> we can reopen back the up. we can reopen the public hearing if you need to. No, 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 no. Didn't want to open. So, it's I'll, I'll take a stab at uh, making a motion that we approve <laughs> the height variance as requested due uh, to the hardship uh, based upon uh, the unique slope of the lot. Um, and uh, there were no conditions on this one. So, um, yeah, that'll be my motion. I will second that. And I'll also say I, I believe that there's a catch all that allows us to give a variance in special and unique circumstances. And I think that applies here too and um, do, so. do you do you think are, are, is, is just to clarify is that your your hardship that you see is the uh the the uniqueness of it's it was approved as presented by by coast department and then was built that way yes okay yeah yeah okay. i mean and to me that's just a it's just a i'm with uh mr bradford here i mean to me that's just a huge thing i I don't know what, I mean, I appreciate what you're saying that it may not be that expensive. I don't know. I mean, right. to me now hiring a builder in Nashville to do anything <laughs> True. is never yeah. expensive. Yeah. So I just, um, that's kind of where I fall, fall. So anyway, we have a motion with, a second. With, so. then there, and there can be more discussions. So. Yeah. Would you entertain a condition of, of not having, you know, living space up there? No, because I mean, I think frankly that, you know, that, if they, if, you know, if the as submitted, I, I mean, I think that's the the other question is if, if the plans as submitted, you know, had called for plumbing or clawed for that. I don't. I, at this point, I don't think it's right for us to claw that back or put conditions on it. Yeah. Well, if I, I can answer that question, so that that part of it wouldn't have been approved and wasn't approved, and that's because this is a single family zoning district. Let me go back into this a little bit. Joey, I'm putting you back in the hot seat again. Let's talk about, because you basically said two things, or I heard two things. One, I heard it was approved at yep. X height. 16 feet. 16 feet. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, in deference to Mr. Bradford's uh, statement earlier, the contractor has some fault at this. So let me, let me put it that way. The, the very face of the permit says maximum height is 16 feet. So, okay, so it's so let's start there. But, okay, fair, the fair point too the, the drawings submitted were exactly what was built. So, we, we have had some in house training over our proper process going forward. But the builder should have known. If they read their permit, in the exercise, okay, you're the lawyer here, just like, sorry, Madam Counsel. He did practice law a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> So you know exactly where I'm headed. There is some responsibility on the builder. I would think there's some. I, I will own codes as part of this. Okay. But to say, I would not accept from a, and I do hear it all the time, Mr. Lawless in our office, you know, um, the professional building this thing has knowledge of what's allowed, what's not, can read permits, I hope, you know. But we are definitely at fault in this for, for a pretty good chunk. I'm not taking all of it, but I'll, I'll, I'll take a sizable portion. Sure thing. So there is still a motion and a second. We can, there's still, we can discuss all we want. I just wanted to remind everybody there is a motion and a second, so. Yeah, the friendly amendment wasn't accepted. All right. Okay, so let's bring the motion to a vote. Uh, there is a motion to approve the application. All in favor say aye. Aye. Three, all opposed. So three to three. So uh, as I understand it, Ms. Waits, that this is, um, tell, us, tell us the procedure has continued to, it's rolled over. Yes, yeah, so hopefully um, council or zoning administrator will Correct me if I'm wrong, but we do have one member who's not present today, and so that, right. that person hasn't voted, and so this matter would be back on our next docket for for our member who's not present today to have an opportunity to weigh in. Okay. So it'll be back on the docket next time around. Does, that, does everybody follow that? Okay. All right. Any? That's our last case, is it not? 
It is, Mr. Chair. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor, all right, adjourn. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>